context in a few moments. Uh, but I'm going to ask Martin first to come and read Habakkuk chapter 3 to us. Thank you. I hope you were all here for the last two weeks. I was away last week, so I haven't heard last week's sermon. But, uh, anyway, this is the third chapter, last chapter of Habakkuk. And if you've got the Church Bible, it's on page 942. And the heading says Habakkuk's Prayer. And it says a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. And it gives a, a word which nobody knows what it means, but it's evident this is like a psalm or a poem, which would have been set to music. So I'll read what it actually says. So this is starting at... Verse 1, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigionoth. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Timan, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendour was like the sunrise, rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Plague went before him, pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth, he looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed, but he marches on forever. I saw the tents of Kushan in distress the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode your horses and your chariots to victory? You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as, they, as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard and my heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nations invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the sheepfold and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights for the director of music on my stringed instruments. Amen. So what we've just been reading, as Martin has pointed out to us, is a song. I reckon Martin should have sung it to us, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, the music is given to us, isn't it? It's Shigyonov. That is the tune. Uh, that's how we understand it, so all you've got to do is find the tune and you could have sung along uh, for us. This is the thing, of course, it does say there on Shiginov, but and that's kind of what we think it means. It's about music, it's about probably the tune that it was sung to. Uh, if you are familiar with music and you would pick up one of those big chunky uh, hymn books down there, what you'll find generally is you've got a, a, a song written on one side and the tune that goes with that song uh, written against it. Some of you will understand what that means. Uh, some of us just join in uh, and enjoy the praises. At the end, of course, uh, Habakkuk chapter 3 here, 
It says, for the director of music on my stringed instruments. I think we have at least one stringed instrument this morning. So again, perhaps we could have sung it together. So it's a song, but what's it all about? That's, uh, I guess, the more important point this morning. Uh, what was it that caused this prophet, Habakkuk, a messenger from God, to uh, sing, to burst into song? This is two and a half thousand years ago, by the way, that he was alive. Uh, so we're going to take a few moments to look into this morning, uh, th th these words this morning. And by the way, uh, some of these words you might regard potentially as offensive. Now it's not unusual for songs to be written that do cause offence. I understand quite recently, uh, Beyonce, not someone I follow closely, uh, but she caused huge offence for the inclusion of the word spaz in one of her songs, which of course is offensive, that's a terrible thing. Uh, to say. So that was edited out fairly quickly. A few years ago, Michael Jackson had to edit uh, some of his, or one of his songs, for various anti-Semitic uh, comments in, uh, that, that he'd included. And of course, that was right to edit those out as well. What I'm going to try and persuade you this morning is that some of these things that are potentially offensive uh, in this particular song should definitely not be edited out. This song, you might have, uh, hopefully you were following that reading as we uh, followed it through, but take verse 12 for example. Um, this is some of the stuff in the Bible that causes some Christians to cringe a little bit and, and not to share it with their friends. It says, in wrath you strode through the earth, in anger you threshed the nations. How can a loving God be angry, some people would say. How can a loving God bring destruction like this? There's other lines in here about piercing people's heads. You might know, what, you might know which part of the Bible that might be referring to. Devouring the wretched in hiding. So yeah, possibly not the passage in the Bible that you might introduce to a friend who's investigating the Christian faith. I'm not criticising you if you'd want to give it a try. There's some really good stuff in here, of course, that is appropriate to everybody. Did you know, by the way, that the Bible has been banned uh, from schools in one American state quite recently, apparently because it contains violence and vulgarity? That's where we've got to today. So this is going to be interesting this morning. Uh, but a bit of context while we're preparing ourselves. We've seen over the last couple of Sundays that Habakkuk had been complaining uh, to God. He's kind of done this bit of a tour almost of Jerusalem and the surrounding areas and he's noticed how badly the people are behaving. This is 600, as I say, 600 BC and the country of Israel, meant to be God's people following his laws, well they completely lost their moral uh, compass. There's violence, there's conflict, there's destruction, there's injustice. And Habakkuk cries out, flick over the page to page one there, he cries out, how long, Lord? How long am I going to cry for help? Why aren't you listening? He's basically saying, why won't you do something? And God says, don't worry, I'm on it. In a little while, he says, these ferocious, uh, this ferocious Babylonian army is going to sweep through Jerusalem like a, a desert storm and, it's, and they're going to destroy everything. That's going to solve your problem, Habakkuk, God says. And Habakkuk complains again and he says, that's not exactly what I had in mind. The talks, by the way, uh, for the last two weeks on the church website, if you do need to catch up. Be careful what you pray for. Once uh, we were travelling back from holiday, and I prayed, we prayed as a family, and I prayed to God that he would bring us home safely. Uh, somebody else in the family prayed that the car wouldn't, her car wouldn't break down. And God answered both of those prayers. She got home really quickly, our car broke down, and then eight... <laughs> Eight hours after her, we got home. The AA couldn't have fixed the problem and we had to leave the car in Birmingham uh, and get a taxi home. God answered both prayers and God answered Habakkuk's prayer here, but not in the way that he expected, not in the way that he wanted. So he went back to God and he said, how can you allow this evil nation to swallow up people who are better than they are? How can you do that, God, he said. And God said, don't worry. We saw this last week. Don't worry. There's going to be justice. Going to be justice for everybody. In the end, God said. In the end, there will be justice. You just need to trust me. And in fact, God says, it's only through trusting me. It's only through faith that you will even yourself get through this. 
the really well-known, well-quoted in the New Testament verse in chapter 2, verse 4, that we focused on a little bit last Sunday is, the righteous will live by faith. Now that's like a summary almost of the whole Bible as we saw last week. And it tells us how we can come to God. It tells us how we have a relationship with God. It's by faith, it's by trusting, it's by believing ultimately in Jesus. So Habakkuk gets this message back from God. So what does he do next? Does he kind of shout and scream, have a bit of a tantrum, a bit like Boris Johnson, self-righteous? It's not fair, it's not fair, they're all out to get me. Is that Habakkuk's kind of response? Well, no. Habakkuk says, okay, you're God. You know what you're doing. I'm not entirely sure that I get this, but I am going to trust you. Habakkuk says. So he kind of sits down, he makes himself a cup of tea, and he writes a song. And this song uh, that he sings, that he writes, it's in three parts. A smaller bit at the beginning, a big chunk in the middle, and then a little bit at the end. The first part here is just in verse 2, and that's where he basically says, okay, God, do it. Go for it. Do what you have promised to do. He says, Lord, I've heard of your fame. And he's not just talking about what God has just told him. He's talking here about other stuff that he's read. He's, he's heard about through scripture, through God's word, events, that, things that God has done uh, in the past. He's heard, I, I, I've heard about your fame. I know what you're like. I know what you're uh, capable of. I've read what you've done. He's probably thinking a little bit here of uh, the Exodus. It's written in the book of Exodus, the second chapter of the Bible, where God did amazing miracles to save his people uh, from slavery uh, in Israel. The fact that he said he, he sent ten plagues. He, he opened up the Red Sea to rescue the people. And then he sent the waves crashing down on the Egyptians who were chasing after them, trying to uh, catch them. And he said, I stand in awe of your deeds, God. You brought justice then. Do it again, he says. You rescued your people then. Do it again now, he said. Do it in our time. So is that our prayer today? Just a, a quick sort of challenge, just a quick thought. Is that our prayer uh, today as we see, see evil, uh, perhaps inside of us, but also uh, around us, in our country, across the world? Are we praying that God will do great deeds of rescue and justice today? Maybe as we see innocent students being stabbed on our streets. Are we praying, Lord, protect us. Lord, bring justice. As we see in the BBC, I think it's been focusing a little bit this week on North Korea. Some of the horrors caused by corruption and persecution in that country. Is our prayer, Lord, save your people. Save everyone. Bring justice. Is that our prayer? As thousands of unborn children die every week in our own country where is that in our prayer list lord have mercy habakkuk knows that these things they make god angry and of course he knows how powerful god is so, and he's no doubt that god is quite capable of doing what he has said he will do but as he prays as he gets into this prayer, it's like he kind of hesitates for a moment and says, bottom of verse 2, in wrath, remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. Well, we'll come back to that phrase in a few moments because it's a really important way of understanding God's wrath and its purposes. So Habakkuk prays, Lord, kind of bring it on. Do what you have promised to do. And then in the next 13 verses, from verse uh, 3 onwards, he kind of has a bit of a vision. He's kind of imagining what is going to happen before it actually ha happens. So God has told him what is going to happen. We see a bit of that in chapter 2. So what we're sort of seeing in chapter 3 here is Habakkuk, almost maybe a dream, I don't know, it could have been a dream, but he's having this vision of what it's going to look like when it happens. I wonder, has anybody ever uh, asked you whether you believe that the Bible is literally true? It's a difficult question, that one, because I would say, personally, I trust many of you were, that yes, I believe the Bible is true. It is the inspired uh, word of God. It's the authority that I try to live by. It's everything that I need to live by. But I wouldn't say that it's all literal. 
Uh, a lot of it is figurative. A lot of it's kind of picture language to help our understanding of God. So Jesus, for example, used um, made up stories to illustrate points that he wanted uh, to make. The book of Revelation at the end of the Bible, well, that's full of allegory, if I can use that word, picture uh, language to help us to understand. The Bible is not always to be interpreted literally. I hope that kind of makes some sense. Happy, obviously, to discuss that afterwards. But I do say that because there's a lot of figurative language in this vision of Habakkuk's. As he kind of imagines what God is about to do, based on what God has told him what he's going to do, you see various pictures. So verse 4 here, it talks about God's splendor. And you might be thinking in this world of CGI and all sorts of films and incredible things that you can see on films today, that where it says rays flashing from his hands, well, that doesn't sound that impressive really, does it? Well, in that day, imagine God rays flashing from his hands. This is not the kind of language that you're used to. Well, verse 8 says that God is angry with the rivers. He's angry with the streams. He's angry with the sea. He's not really angry with the sea, by the way. He made it. He's not really angry with the rivers. It's figurative language, and it's talking about powers that are opposed to God. That is what he's angry with. Verse 10, mountains saw you and writhed. Verse 11, the sun and the moon stood still in the heavens. Now, that might be literal. God is quite capable of making that happen, but it might well be figurative. The big point here is it's all about God's power. And the fact that he is able to deliver on the promises that he has made and the fact that Habakkuk believes him. Nothing compares to God's uh, power. You might think of, I don't know, think of the most powerful, dangerous, destructive thing in the world today. Perhaps nuclear weapons might be what comes uh, to mind. Even nuclear weapons, they don't cause whole mountains to crumble, as the language here describes. They don't split the earth in this kind of way. Well, when God rescued the slaves in Egypt, he sent plagues and he sent pestilences. He sent darkness and blood and hailstone. And verse 6 says here, he stood and shook the earth. He looked. He made the nations tremble. This is our God. This is the God that we come and behold. He is awesome. Literally awesome. There is nothing that God cannot do. The miracles Jesus did, remember, they were often there to point to the power of God, to demonstrate who he was. And of course, then, Jesus, then God raised Jesus himself from the dead. Perhaps, the, well, perhaps definitely the greatest miracle ever uh, performed. But in Habakkuk's vision, a lot of God's power is associated with his anger, with his wrath, with judgment and that doesn't sit very comfortably in the culture that we live in today where, where justice and healing are usually sought not through retribution in this kind of way but through mediation through negotiation through counseling through uh, therapy and I'm not talking any of those things all good things but sometimes justice does involve locking people up think about the guy who raped and murdered Sarah Everard. He's in prison for life, and I'm guessing most of us think that's the right outcome. Think back a little bit to the liberation of Auschwitz in uh, 1945, the concentration camp. Imagine, it was a Soviet army at that point, imagine them kind of gently asking the German army to stand aside nicely so that they could get on with their work. That wasn't going to happen. It required a gun battle at the time. Soldiers on both sides got killed. And that level of violence was necessary because it was about saving lives. If they'd hung around and tried to negotiate, more and more Jewish lives would have been lost. And that is where I want us just to come back to that prayer, the end of verse 2 here. In wrath, remember mercy. So I think we can sort of read that and think, well, it's one or the other, isn't it? It's either wrath or it's mercy. Can you possibly have the two together? You're either angry or you're going to be merciful. Well, it's not always like that. It wasn't like that in Auschwitz. If those, as I said, if those so Soviet soldiers didn't fight on that day, many more Jewish lives would have 
been loved. There, there had to be wrath, there had to be violence in order to, be, to, to, to have mercy, in order to save lives. Rescue required resistance. Punishing the oppressor is often necessary in order to save the oppressed. Wrath and mercy together. And that is why God's wrath is a good thing. That is why God's anger is a good thing. He needed to punish, all those years ago, the Egyptians in order to save the Israelites. God needed to punish here, and it did happen a few years after Habakkuk had prophesied here. It did happen to the, to, to the Babylonians. They were punished in order that the people could be saved. Here's, uh, you, you may recognise this line from a song that we sometimes sing by Graham Kendrick. Come and see the King of Love. See, he's talking about Jesus in case you're not aware. The purple robe, the crown of thorns he wears, soldiers mocking Ruler sneering, he lists the cruel cross, lone and friendless now, he climbs towards the hill, we worship at your feet, where wrath and mercy meet. Where God placed his wrath, his anger on Jesus, his only beloved son, in order that he might show mercy to the likes of you and me. Where wrath and mercy meet. And a guilty world is washed by love's pure stream, the pure stream of Jesus' blood. For us, he was made sin. Help me take it in. These are difficult things to take it in. Take it in. We, we need God's help to understand these things and to grasp them and to trust them. Deep wounds of love cry out, Father, forgive. I worship. I worship the Lamb who was slain. When Jesus died, he took God's wrath upon himself. He didn't deserve that punishment. He was taking the punishment that we deserve for our sin so that we could be forgiven. Wrath and mercy coming together for our salvation. And that mercy is available to every one of us. We all need it. We all need it every day. Well, in this vision that Habakkuk sang about, we see Jesus. A number of different ways. We see him in the Babylonians who faced God's judgment. Jesus himself it kind of stood in the way there as the Babylonians uh, were destroyed. So Jesus was uh, destroyed on our behalf. We're going to be taking the Lord's Supper in a little while. And that reminds us of the judgment that Jesus paid so that we could be forgiven. We also see Jesus as the one who will return one day as the final judge of the world. Revelation chapter 1 gives us this picture of the future. I'm just going to read a few verses from it. But it talks about the son of the, son of, uh, the, the, someone like the Son of Man. So it's talking uh, about Jesus here. Dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. Again, figurative language. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. In his right hand he held seven stars. Coming out of his mouth with a sharp two-edged sword, his face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. Now look back to Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 4. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flash from his hand where his power was hidden. You think the Babylonians are powerful? They were the empire of the day. Of course they were powerful. You think today nuclear weapons are dangerous? Well, they've got nothing on Jesus. If we're going to put our fear in one place, let's put it in Jesus. He's the one that we should be worried about. Habakkuk understood this. So let's come to the last part of uh, his song here, his response. It says, verse 16, I heard... And this is not surprising when you think about what's just come before here. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. God's power is terrifying. Reminds me of the time when Jesus calmed the storm on the lake. 
And in a moment, he saved the lives, as he was doing so, of his friends who were in the boat with him. What was their response when he did that? This is what they said. They were terrified. They asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. But do you remember what Jesus said to them? Why are you still afraid? Why do you have no faith? Jesus wasn't overly impressed by their faith at that particular moment. Well, if you compare their faith to what we're seeing of Habakkuk at this moment, well, Habakkuk is way ahead when it comes to faith in God. He felt the power of what God was going to do. He had faith that God could do it. And we see in verse 2 that he's heard of God's fame. He's read about what God's done in the past, just as we can. And it made him shake as he read it, as he thought these things. But his faith was firm. Verse 16, he said, Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Yet I will wait patiently. I mean, what a kind of response that is to these awesome things that he's been seeing. What an example that is. Whatever danger there may be ahead of us, and I'm guessing none of us really knows, perhaps there's one or two things that we might suspect could be ahead of us, whatever threat might be hanging over us this morning, maybe there's something that's particularly uh, concerning you. Can you say, can I say, I will wait patiently for God to sort it out. I will wait patiently. And this wasn't, this wasn't Habakkuk kind of thinking positively, I, I'm going to get through this. I'm, you know, he knew the reality of the situation that was coming. He knew it was going to mean hardship for the people. It says here, doesn't it, verse 17, no fruit, no harvest, no meat on his plate, no cattle in the stalls. He, he understood that a terrible time was ahead of him. Even though he trusted in God's ju justice and his judgment, things were not going to be easy for him. Really challenging times were ahead. What would you do? What would I do in that situation? You know something bad is likely to happen but you've got enough faith to see through it. It's going to be all right in the end. You kind of know that, and many of us perhaps are in that kind of position this morning. What would our response be? I think a lot of us, it would be kind of gritting our teeth, thinking, I've got to get through this. God is going to help me, but it's all about, more, more about survival, more the kind of Bear grills type of approach. You've just got to get through this, get through to the other end. Well, that is not Habakkuk's approach here. Absolutely not. Look at verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet, my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Habakkuk is somebody whose faith enables him to rejoice. Not just get through, but rejoice in the face of of evil on the basis that he knows God. He knows about God. So how much more can we rejoice? Uh, you think about how much Habakkuk knew about God at that point. And that's kind of restricted to the scriptures until that point. Think about how much more we can rejoice because we know much more than Habakkuk knew. We know more about God. We know about Jesus' death and his resurrection. We have his spirit at work inside of us. If Habakkuk can rejoice in his circumstances, well, surely we can too. In saying that, I realise I don't know exactly what each of you are going through. I recognise that. And maybe you're thinking, well, there's no way if he knew what I'm going through, there's no way he could expect me to be happy going through that or in what is about to happen to me, what I'm facing this week. How can I possibly be happy? Well, as sensitively as I can, and I recognise that I don't know every circumstance, I would urge you to reconsider. If the Sovereign Lord is your strength, there literally is nothing that he cannot give you joy in. There is nothing that he cannot give you peace in. Habakkuk sang for joy in the midst of his confusion. He sang for joy in the midst of huge concerns. And I pray that each of us will be able to sing for joy with the writer uh, of, of another song. We're going to sing this in a, in a few moments after we've taken the Lord's Supper together. 
This man wrote a song uh, where he just received news that his own family had been taken from him in terrible circumstances. And he, he wrote, when peace like a river, uh, it's old language, so it says, attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou, you, God, hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. He says, so, uh, though Satan should buffet, though the enemy should attack, he says, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. Amen. Can you we just take a moment to quietly reflect on what God has been saying to us this morning whilst we set up the Lord's table uh, and take, before we take the Lord's Supper together. So let's just have a few moments of quiet. <clears throat>